Hello, 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 Ajit sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, yeah, yeah. Sir, Hari Krishna yeah. will be present in your slides. Yeah, that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. Fine. No issue. So no issue. everything is okay. Now YouTube streaming has also started. We are about to start the program. Sorry for the delay. Sorry for the inconvenience. I mean, sorry participants. Are you able to present? Are you able to? Yeah, okay. In a world of constant change and streaming technology, I found solace in the forest where a tree remains a tree. A blissful evening to all of you. As beautifully said by Valen Crossby, we always go hand in hand with nature unchanged. The Department of Microbiology of Sri Narana Guru College has organized a way beneficial rostrum to pop out all our curiosities and to conclude to a better solution. But before we begin, let's solemnly request the expression of peace by beginning with a prayer.
Monica, I just sent you the email with the client. I'm the doc now, but I think it's an older version. Can you send an update? Monica, check your messages when you can. There's something important in there. What is files be uploaded? Okay. With this, all of our apprenticeship with nature begins. To bide a warm welcome to each and everyone attending this session, I invite Dr. G. Geeta, Assistant Professor, Department of Microbiology, for the welcome address. Ma'am, please. A very good evening to one and all gathered over here. Myself, Dr. Geeta, on behalf of the Department of Microbiology, Sri Narayana Guru College, Kayamato. Let me welcome our beloved principal, Dr. M. Ilangovan, who has given all kinds of permissions to conduct this program. I welcome you, sir. Today, we have all gathered on over here to participate in the program, Apprenticeship with Nature. Nature, are you someone who connect deeply with nature? Do you uh, want to understand more about how nature inspires mankind? Today we have our expert with us. So let me invite Dr. Ajit Madhavan, Associate Professor, Amrita School of Biotechnology, Am Amrita Puri Kollam. In spite of his busy schedule, he has given us a precious honor for this program. On behalf of our department, we welcome you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Now, let me welcome our beloved HOD, Dr. Nisi, who has been a motivational force for the entire department and organized this event at lightning speed. I welcome you, ma'am. I also welcome all staff members of our department and other department and all our, our students and participants who have joined us once again. I welcome you all. Thank you, ma'am, for the welcome. Before, before we work upon any object, 
we should know what the object is. And for the same purpose, here we have the theme of the event. Biomimicry or biomimetics is the emulation of the model system and elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems. The term biomimetics and biomimicry are divided, derived from the ancient Greek words bios, which means life, and mimesis, which means imitation or to imitate. Biomimetics has given rise to new technologies inspired by biological solution at macro and also in nanoscales. Humans have looked at nature for answers to problems throughout their existence. Nature has solved engineering problems such as self-healing abilities, environmental exposure, tolerance and resistance, hydrophobicity, self-assembly and harnessing solar energy all with its natural paths. Now, to introduce the chief guest, I invite Dr. Nisi Prasad, Associate Professor and Head Department of Microbiology. Ma'am, please. Uh, Nisi ma'am, you are muted Nisi ma'am. Good evening. It's my privilege to introduce today's chief guest, Dr. Ajit Madhavit, Associate Professor, Amardar School of Biotechnology, Kollam, Kerala. Dr. Ajit Madhavan is having a total teaching experience of 24 years and um, he has published uh, 17 um, papers in national and international journals. His grants and project sanction, the grants and project sanction to Dr. Rajit comes in this way. He is the awardee of DBT Bayrak uh, Award, like Government of India, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation US for an amount of 60.8 lakhs. That is just one. Second uh, uh, project sanction to Dr. Rajit include DBT and IC Impacts Canada for an amount of 38.5 lakhs. Another uh, grant awarded to Dr. Rajit is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, grant of 58 lakhs. He has two patents in his credit and uh, he has international collaborations in uh, with the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation US. UNAM Mexico, TU Delft Holland. He has organized many academy conferences and he is participated with Livin Lab with uh, designed and built a prototype of horizontal decentralized septic uh, tank system installed in few villages in North India. He has hosted international students in sanitation biotechnology lab. When, you, when we come to Dr. Ajit's industrial experience, he is collaborated with ERAM Scientific Trivandrum on sanitation solution as a part of Bill and Melinda Gate Foundation project. He is collaborating with a company named Nairo, located in Kochi, in development of an enzyme-based oxygen generator. But he is also a part of a startup, Purnam Biotech, out, uh, out of sanitation biotechnology lab, Amrda School of Biotechnology, Kollam. He is also a chairman, member of many committees and clubs of Amrda School of Biotechnology. When we come to the awards of Dr. Rajit, he is a recipient of numerous uh, prestigious awards. And uh, uh, the most important one comes in this way. He is the winner of Best Poster Award in Grand Challenge India 2017 meeting at New Delhi, organized by Bayrak DBT, Government of India. 
also he is a, a recipient of uh, government of india paira grand challenge award march uh, 2014 for bill melinda gates foundation us department of biotechnology he has guided numerous students pg students ug students and also ayurvedic medical students etc he is also involved in framing syllabus and many other academic activity he was also an invited speaker for many national and international conferences and uh, uh, he apart from this apart from dr ajit's uh, academic uh, contribution like apart from his work dr ajit is an excellent artist and he is an expert in drawing and painting above all most importantly he is a student lover and he always love to work for students and he always love to be with students and he always work for the benefit of students with whole heartedly i would like to invite my friend uh, dr ajit madhavan for the much awaited expected uh, talk for today's um, webinar i welcome you sir thanks a lot ma'am thanks a ton thanks for that uh, generous introduction ma'am uh, to just capture my emotion right now i am feeling at home the very name nisi nisi ma'am uh, juby elangovan sir and most of the students here kind of brings about uh, nostalgia brings about good memories so it doesn't make an, an this doesn't require an an effort to be part of this particular group it's home for me thank you so much ma'am let me also thank geeta ma'am for the introduction and uh, amrita al almost gave it away uh, giving uh, the uh, kind of uh, kind of kind of in a capsule what biomimicry is and what are its scope and so on so in fact what is required is just to elaborate on whatever that she said thank you so much for that amrita can you yeah is ma'am shall i start please sir please sir yeah thank you so much ma'am okay youtube so, uh, uh, youtube streaming is also going uh, well sir okay. so okay. this is for participant so we, okay. it's also going uh, yeah. so yes sir please sir let's put in an ad and responsibility ma'am that's okay <laughs> thank you so much ma'am for the opportunity uh, at the very outset we probably are having a kind of a troubled relationship with nature troubled in the sense that it need not be very deliberate uh, mischief deliberate uh, exploitation that we are making rather it could be an inadvertent exploitation of nature itself in any ways the relationship is not appropriate the relationship is not going well so we are looking at nature in a different perspective than the way in which it has it has to appropriately looked at so that's exactly the reason why we are going to get introduced to a relatively new discipline i would say a two decade old discipline which as amrita mentioned biomimicry or biomimetics it is called which looks at nature in a different perspective not in an exploitative perspective rather as a mentor pupil association so that's where we all need to be an apprentice with nature so what are we talking about can we go to the next slide ra so simplistically put we all try to reproduce nature in our own different ways for example as somebody mentioned i'm a lover of painting though i am a satisfactory exponent of painting i'm not sure but i love paintings so that is the way in which probably no not though deliberately want to reproduce nature capture a particular scene put that into a small space of a canvas and so on so we all reproduce nature in our own ways 
So there are umpteen number of examples in the ways in which uh, the nature is reproduced. For example, painting is one. Next. Leonardo da Vinci, the great Renaissance painter, you know, he looked at nature differently. He studied birds, for example, in order to create flying machines. So these flying machines, you know, very recently, not very recently, I, I would say, four or five years before, uh, National Geographic uh, it kind of commissioned a team to build the instruments that Leonardo da Vinci designed and drew. So those designs, in fact, were functional even now. So that is the ingenuity of uh, Leonardo da, da Vinci. So he looked at nature, he looked at the flying birds, understood its aerodynamic properties, how does it fly, how, did, how does it steer, and so on, and designed. So that is his way of uh, reproducing nature. Next. Wilbur Wright and or or Orville Wright, the Wright brothers, they are famously called. In fact, it is said that they were inspired by falcons to build the first aircraft it is called, though it was not called as an aircraft, it was called as a kite rather, but they were able to build one and do a first 10 minute sortie to prove that man can fly like a bird. So in fact, the inspiration came from the flight of falcons. They very meticulously understood the flight of falcons. What does the tail fin do? How do they uh, maneuver uh, their body and so on? So based on which they built what is called as the first aircraft, then the whole game changed. You know that the aircraft industry um, uh, kind of became commercial. They went into military and so on. So within a short span of time, the only fast uh, development that we have seen in any vertical for that matter is in the aircraft industry. Next. Another important example is, they, these are the examples where people did not know that they were getting inspired from nature and they were building something useful out of it. But they did. Most of us do. But I'll talk about a discipline that actually, actually concretely put forward a set of rules and regulations, a set of content so that it can be called as a discipline itself. We are talking about George the Mestrel. George the Mestrel was the one who built the Velcro. So Velcro is touted to be even used in the space suits, you know. So these Velcro, the Velcros are non-zipper fasteners they are. So initially it was all zipper fasteners in order to bring two materials together. In this case, the first instance where a non-zipper fastener was built. So how did that happen when he went for a vacation to Alps along with his dog? So he found very menacing to find at the end of the Day, the dog fur was filled with or stuck with burrs, small thorny seeds. So he did not consider that as a menace, rather he considered that as an opportunity. He wanted to know how the burrs get stuck onto the, on, onto the mane of the dog. So he found out that there are hook-like structures on the microscopic hook-like structure on the seeds that get stuck onto the sliver of the dog fur. So he found out a mechanism where he built two structures, one with hooks and another with fibers, which can cling on together, which we nowadays call as Velcro. So, the, so though the inspiration was instantaneous, it took around 10 years in order to develop a technology because it took a lot of time to convince people that this is a new mechanism that can work that can be more, that can have more utility, that can ensure more utility than the zipper fasteners. Next. So the question is, we already have that internal urge to reproduce nature in our own ways. It could be the Dermestrel's way of of building a Velcro. It could be painter's way of painting a picture. It could be an 
engineer's way like or a painter engineer combo way of uh, uh, of da vinci in order to do that and so on but where are we right now is the question i told you before itself the relationship with nature is not ideal it is not aspirational is not the way in which we wish so what has happened where have we gone wrong is the question so we need to do a reality check so probably the agricultural revolution that happened 10000 years ago you know in fact is responsible for that strained relationship with nature though we consider agricultural field to be close to nature it is not so agricultural fields were once natural ecosystem that has been cleared in order to create a monoculture so in fact agricultural field is deceiving deceiving in the way in which it appears so agricultural revolution in fact started that strained relation 10000 years ago then we started running away from nature itself with the advent of industrial revolution in the 18th century you know that our functioning is unsustainable meaning with the limited resources we need to have we are looking at having an unlimited development which is not possible so our way of functioning is unsustainable we are the only species probably are greedy we store things for ourselves but in nature for example we including nature for example they share you can see many instances if you take a small ecosystem you can see the components of that ecosystem sharing material and energy so we are probably the only form which stores which is greedy we are the only species probably which started fouling our nest so it is said that there is a stockpile of nuclear weapons that can annihilate the earth seven times over i don't know why it requires seven times over once it is gone it is gone so we have stockpiles spuriously polluting our environment so we are the only species probably which can foul our nest but you can see a small bird you know every as a housekeeping activity it cleans the nest every time removing the excreta removing the uh, the dropped feathers and so on cleaning its nest we are probably the only species which can spoil the nest which can spuriously pollute the nest in fact we went to an extent where our fruit footprints is already there people are scientists are actually thinking about coining the period occupied by humans as anthropocene because we have left tell tale signs of our existence in form of plastics in form of uh, recalcitrant materials and so on recalcitrant that can't be degraded for thousands uh, of years you know so we have polluted our natural resources climate change is imminent and it is facing us new emerging inf uh, infections are already here the pandemic is one example so we have forced many of the species into the brink of existence brink of extinction many species for that matter solely because of human activity so the the, the kind of a line between need and greed seems to have somehow blurred so we have legitimized greed itself somehow it has blurred so somehow we have set ourselves to a very difficult goal of infinite development from finite resources infinite development from finite resources which is not possible at all so i'm not trying to at the beginning of this presentation trying to paint a bleak picture rather there is some hope there is some hopeful element to this okay so it is said that in the next slide run please amrita next slide it is said that in chaos theory you know whenever a system reaches its height of chaos it near it means that something is going to happen some kind of a change is going to happen so probably 
we are around that particular corner. We are about to change. So that is one hopeful aspect of it. We have realized what our mistakes are. And we know we have the means, we have the expertise to make a U-turn probably, to go back to our home once more. So another hopeful aspect is every five years, the knowledge on biology is doubling. That's what people say. So the implications of that doubling is we are able to understand the working of the nature very clearly. We are becoming more sensitive now. Previously, 100 years back, animals were considered as a game. They were killed, not now. So we have become very sensitive to the functioning of nature. That itself is a kind of a shift in the perspective of humans. They are no more looking at animals as different from ourselves. So thanks to the doubling of information in biology, we know what we don't know is the question. So all problem that is relevant to us, all problem that is relevant to us probably has a solution. When you look carefully, you have a solution in nature. So why do you think so? This is not a kind of a belief. This is not a faith. So people used to say that nature can teach you everything. Uh, look at nature and so on. Probably it is born out of belief. I'm not talking about the thing that is born out of belief. I'm talking about some tangible signs that can be that can be understood from understanding the functioning of nature. So why do you say that most of the solutions are right there in nature? You need to have an eye to find out those solutions because it had 3.8 million years of head start. So nature, whatever organism that you see right now, which you call them as your kins, like your cousins, are in fact models, are in fact designs, are in fact systems that are highly successful, that came, that were successful over these 3.8 million years. So it had a 3.8 million years of head start. That's the idea. So if you want an example, for example, when you look at your immune response, the immune system that you're talking about, we clearly now know that the immune system is not built for us. Rather, it, built, it is built for, it is built for the grazing organism, especially the protozoans that grazes the bacteria. So you're actually looking at a protozoan that is similar to your phagocytes. So the immune response was built even before the advent of the human beings. So likewise, you can see umpteen number of examples. Solutions are there since nature had a 3.8 million years of head start. So if you think, for example, our hubris, our, our blown up pride on ourselves, the hubris we call it, our hubris, if you think that the wheel is our invention, look at the flagellar apparatus of the bacteria, the fastest moving motor, 1000 RPM per second, it is the speed. It doesn't move like a wheel though, it moves in small states, stages, phases. So it's already there, the wheel is already there. So wheel is considered to have powered the cultural revolution in humans. So if you consider the wheel to be the invention, the sole invention of humans, you're wrong. It's already there. Our immune system, as I told you, is perfected before it came into being. So what are you looking at? In fact, the prospect is, the scope is, the opportunity is 30 million solutions already there in the nature. 30 million solutions. That is the projected number of species that is presented in our biosphere. 30 million solutions are already there. You need to watch keenly. You need to observe keenly in order to understand the solution. Retrofit it into your problem. Then you have done something beautiful. Okay, so let me warn you, this is not biophilia. Biophilia in the sense that we all love nature. It's there in our being. It is built in our system. We all love nature. But this is something more. It's not biophilia. This is not born, born out of our love for nature rather our respect for nature. We consider the solutions of nature to be supreme, to be sustainable, so that you can rely on them. That's the idea. Okay, Amrita, next. 
So the question that we need to ask, bury your vanity, bury your hubris, just ask a question, simple question. How does nature solve a particular problem is the question. Okay, since I told you it has 3.8 billion years of head start. Amrita, next. So this, she has already defined. Janine B. Benius is considered to be the mother of biomimicry or biomimetics. As I told you, biomimetics, in fact, not as a discipline, existed even be before Jan Janine Benius constituted it as a particular discipline. It existed even before. But Janine B. Benius gave it a structure, okay, so that you can you can you can use this particular discipline in order to create something useful okay i'll talk about that little later so bios life mimesis to imitate okay so you watch nature the structural and the functional principles of nature and try to imitate them that's what biomimicry means janine benias the name that you should remember she has written a very small book biomimicry Innovation from nature, it is. Small book, but beautiful book it is. A revolutionary book. Next one. So innovation inspired by nature, sorry. Innovation inspired by nature, just a seminal book written by uh, Janine Benius. All, all of us should read that. It's a small read, but it's beautiful. Okay, the next. Okay, so as I told you, this is not biophilia. It is a tangible science. Okay, it is a science. All scientific methods can be applied here in order to uh, establish its efficacy, in order to establish its sustainability, okay, and so on. So how this science differs from other sciences that we are talking about? This science looks at nature from a slightly different perspective not from the exploitative perspective that I told you, not from the perspective of exploiting nature in order to gain something. It looks at nature in a different perspective altogether. It looks at nature as a model. It looks na at nature as a measure. It looks at nature as a mentor. So model in the sense that you understand the structural and the functional principles of biological system, and you borrow those principles in order to create something. So you consider nature to be a model. You consider nature to be a measure. Measure in the sense that you want to know whether the technology that you have devised is sustainable or not. What does sustainability means? It is relative. The longevity of a particular technology is what we call sustainability. So whether a particular thing is sustainable or not, you Compare it with, it's an anvil on which you compare whether your technology is sustainable or not. It's a measure. The nature is a measure. The nature is a model. The nature is a measure. The nature is a mentor. So it is the, the, the behavioral science says that when you have a mentor, you learn fast. When you have a mentor, you learn quickly. So you consider nature to be a mentor. You don't consider nature to be the one to be exploited, a one that it's, it's, it's in waiting to be exploited. Rather, you consider nature to be a mentor. So you can see the difference. You're looking from a different angle altogether, not in the way which we are used to be looking at nature. Rather, we are looking at nature from a different angle. You consider it to a model, a measure, or a mentor. Okay, I can give you a few examples. Then, then consider one or two in order to drive home the point how nature can act as a model, Nature can act as a measure and nature can act as a mentor. That's the idea. Okay, I'll give you some interesting examples. These examples already is, uh, is, is indicated in the poster itself and Amrita also mentioned it. But anyway, let's try revisiting it. They, those are really interesting. Next, Amrita. Next. Okay, take this example. So Shinkansen 
bullet train is considered to be a kind of a flagship bullet trains of uh, Japan. They were put against a wall and almost at the verge of decommissioning the whole bullet train because it creates something called as a sonic boom. Sonic boom is nothing but you have a tunnel when, because Japan is considered to be dotted with hills and mountains, so it has to pass through hills and mountains in order to reach, uh, in, or, in order to connect towns together. So it has to have tunnels. So what really happens is the density of air inside the tunnel and the density of the air outside the tunnel is different. It is more lighter here and more denser inside. So what happens, this train at sonic speed, at the speed of sound, moves from a light, lighter air or less denser air into a more denser air. When it moves, it creates a kind of a pressure wave at the front of the bullet train. So that pressure wave creates a sound that is more than 20,000 decibels. It is called as a sonic boom. So the sonic boom was responsible for grounding the Concorde airplanes, you know, of the pride of Italy and uh, Britain, if I'm correct. So likewise, they were almost on the verge of decommissioning it. Why? Because it creates crack in the high rise buildings. It is sensitive to the pets and so on. So they wanted a solution. So the engineers were sent out to uh, into the wilderness, I would say, to find out whether nature has any solutions to it. They found out a beautiful solution. The same problem, I, I'll, I'll tell you, you need to only understand the problem and and adopt it in a way that it could serve as a solution for you. So the kingfisher also experiences a similar problem. It moves from air to water. So the kingfishers, it's a spectacle to see them fishing. So for example, in the land post, you have a small puddle down. You have small fishes, imagine. So it's there up in the lamp post. It, it has a very keen eye. It knows where the fish is moving. Then it plunges, almost drops dead. Okay, it, 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 it crouches itself and drops and goes into the water. So it's very difficult, you know. You can see that due to the, due to the refraction, due to the differential refraction index of water and air, you know, the object is slightly shifted. You, can, you, know, you cannot easily pick up a coin that is in a bucket. So you have games designed on that, you know. So this kingfisher correctly adjusts itself and drops. There are beautiful YouTube videos. Underwater cameras have been kept in order to capture them. So you can see that the fish doesn't even know that the kingfisher has gone and dropped inside. Doesn't even know. So it so seamlessly moves from the air to the water. Seamlessly. So the same thing that your bullet train is not able to do. It's not able to seamlessly move from the light, light, lighter density air to a uh, more denser air inside the tunnel. But this little bird is able to do it and capture it. Okay, because the requirement is it shouldn't disturb, it shouldn't create turbulence in the water so, so that your fish is prompted and it is it is prompted and and, and, it, and, and it just swims away. It shouldn't happen. So the evolutionary requirement for the kingfisher is to create a seamless entry from air to water. That's what it does. So what did they do was understood the shape of the beak of the kingfisher. So its angular shape, its length are responsible for this. So they meticulously studied them and put that same kind of a structure on front of bullet trains. So huge difference, I would say. So 30 percentage, the the pressure wave reduced by 30 percentage, electricity usage by 50 percentage, speed improved and so on. What else do you require? Who, to whom can you give credit to? There are no patents. There is no inventor. Nature is the inventor. I get my point. If you are not convinced with this, I'll give you another example. Next. Now you can see whenever you are talking about killing pathogens, 
killing microorganisms, killing bacteria, for example, you're always talking about drugs. You're talking about antibiotics and so on. So you need to have a chemicals in order to kill the microorganisms. But you have a system, biological system, that kills the organism not by chemicals, but just by modifying its surface. So if you look at, compare the whales and shark, you know, at least pictorially you can see that the whales are little dirty. They are spotted with barnacles and so on, like in the hulls of the ship, you know, it is dotted with barnacles. It is dirty. But in the case of sharks, it is glistening clean because the, the requirement for the shark is to move smoothlessly, stealthier, quicker in water. So it has to have a aquadynamic surface. So in order to do that, it, things shouldn't stick onto its surface. Usually things start sticking onto the surface due to some kind of a microbial succession, you know. First an organism forms a biofilm on the surface. Then you can see higher organism starts um, occupying it. Then you can see the barnacles attaching to the surface and so on. That's how it is. So the shark, they just modify the surface in order to dissuade the organism from sticking to it. What does it do? It doesn't present a uniform surface. It doesn't create a uniform surface. It, is, it creates a discontinuous sur surface. So what did people do is they took a piece of skin of the shark and electron micrographed it. So they saw small denticles, structures like your teeth, hence the name denticles. So the denticles are arranged like an armor plate. So they do not give a uniform surface. So the bacteria cannot uniformly stick onto it because the bacteria should be considered to be a very flexible bag, the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane, you know. So what really happens is not only shark, there are different other examples. In fact, we have also carried out a few, a few work on this. I'll talk about that at the end of the talk, a little later. By providing a discontinuous surface, it never allows the bacteria to stay on the surface. In fact, it kills the bacteria. It doesn't just dissuade it from forming a biofilm. Rather, it kills the organism. I'll talk about that a little later. Next. So you can see these are the experiments that has been done. So based on this, they created a material which is called a sharklet. They imprinted on a polythene material, a same microscopic discontinuous surface. So on the right hand side that you see is the discontinuous surface. On the left, uh, on, 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 the, uh, on the top panel, on the top panel, left hand side is the sharklet material. On the right hand side is the actual structure on the surface of the skin of shark. So they created a discontinuous material. So look at the results. So you have a surface that doesn't have any discontinuity in it, that doesn't have any artifacts in it. On this side, you have denticle-like shapes. So you can see, even when higher number of bacteria sticks onto the surface, it really does not form a biofilm. So even at the third panel, you can see the biofilm being formed. But on the right hand side, you can see only at the when the concentration of the organism, when the number of organisms is higher, it's, it, it superficially sticks onto the surface. Otherwise, it doesn't. It dissuades the sticking of the bacteria, biofilm formation of the bacteria very effectively. So these materials are called as sharklets. They can be stuck on the walls of the hospitals. They can be uh, uh, affixed on the surface of the operation uh, theater tables and so on, gloves, aprons, and so on. So which can effectively dissuade the bacteria from sticking. Thanks to shark. Next. Then this Daimler Chrysler, they wanted a futuristic car, which was, which, 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 which is a car, which is, um, which guzzles up lesser uh, fuel which is very economic with regard to fuel requirement, which has higher maneuverability, which has high speed, should be lightweight and so on. So we have to look for. So they in fact looked for different organisms amongst which they chose an unlikely organism, which is considered to be very sluggish. When anybody sees it at first sight, it probably is the sluggish 
of all organisms. These are called as box fishes. Box fishes, they stay in the continental shelf. You can see the water body, you know, in the sea. They form a shallower shelf, then it goes deeper. So this shallower shelf, you know, is actually more turbulent because you have wave swashing against the shore at this particular region. So these organisms, moreover, these organisms are brightly colored. Why? Because the maximum amount of life penetrates in that particular area. So since photooxidation can happen, you know, these organisms are brightly colored in order to capture the light, in order to prevent itself from being oxidized by light, rather. Okay, so they found out an organism which is considered to be the most finest of all organisms in terms of maneuverability, in terms of construction of its structure. Probably the only fish which has an exoskeleton. It's just called as a box fish. It's very lightweight. How it makes itself lightweight is, in this, is that it doesn't create itself with uniform material. Rather, it knows where to add more materials. Wherever reinforcement is required, it adds more material. Wherever just a plain surface is re required, it thins the material. So it judiciously uses the material so that it can improve its buoyancy. I get my point? So this particular fish, even though the environment is turbulent, they can beautifully stay aloft, swim beautifully. So they thought that this fish is the right candidate for creating an eco car. That that's how they created a concept car that uses the principle of construction of the exoskeleton of the box fish. And the shape even is maintained in this particular in order to maintain the aerodynamic aspect of the car. So it has become very lightweight. This car is very fuel efficient. It can run faster and so on. So thanks to the box fish. The next. This is another beautiful kind of an innovation, I would say, inspired from nature. So the beauty of this particular discipline is, it's not about the pleasure that you derive from innovating something. Rather, in the process, you come to understand a biological system in its details. That's when you really appreciate the ingenuity with which it is created. I wouldn't say it is created, evolved. Okay, so look at Namib beetles. Namib beetles, it's, it's said that early in the morning, in the Namib desert, where there is no rainfall throughout the year, people thought that no flora and fauna will thrive in that particular desert. Still, there is flora and fauna. So the question is, where do they get their water from? So they depend on the ration of water that comes early in the morning as a fog. All of them, they depend on it. Most of the organisms, they have devised ingenious ways in order to capture water from literally thin air. How do they do it? So the Namib beetles, there are beautiful videos that you, uh, you should watch. It, as though it, it's going for a work early in the morning, it climbs the sand dunes and faces the direction of the fog. It as though prostrates before the fog, it prostrates. It has a surface which is called as a carapace. The carapace surface is actually hydrophobic in nature, like a lotus leaf, as Amrita mentioned. Hydrophobic surface with hydrophilic bumps in it. So what happens is the carapace is colder. So the fog falls on the carapace. There are hydrophilic surfaces to which the water molecules, they stick. The water molecule, they continue sticking. It took, becomes too heavy, starts flowing. It leaves the cat due to its weight. It starts leaving. It flows. Why? Because you have the other hydrophobic surfaces to which the water doesn't stick. And it flows and comes and collects at the front of the Namib beetle at its mouth. It sucks the water. Doesn't require any well. There is no groundwater usage. There is no dependence on water bodies, just fog. So can you create something? that can capture water from thin air is the question. So they created something called as a dew bank bottle. So dew bank bottle is nothing but it's a kind of a stainless steel corrugated, a cap-like structure. So you can see that there is a surface, the surface of the cap, which is corrugated. And the rim 
of that particular hemispherical structure is actually a tube. So what really ha can happen is the when when this when this bottle is kept outside in the evening, early in the morning, you get a few glasses of water. So the fog floss falls on the surface, condenses, and the water goes down, collects in the rim. You open the bottle and you drink it. Based on the same technology, fog capturing nets have been created. So people have created greenhouses in the middle of the desert. So with these structures dotting the wall of the greenhouses. So the fog falls on these walls, get collected and goes down into the water. There are certain certain excellent studies I can, I can suggest to you later where people have found out that even around a few kilometers around such greenhouses, the vegetation has improved due to the recharging of the groundwater. Okay, thanks to the small, indiscreet bugs, okay, that does daily go up the sand dune and collect water, thanks to those ingenious organisms. So the question is where you need to look at in order to find solution is the question. Okay, next Amrita. <coughs> okay, so this is the tangible science. Don't get <clears throat> bogged down by the magnitude of solutions that is available. That is the only problem with biomimicry. You do not really know which solution to take. So that's exactly the reason why I caution you don't get bogged down by the solutions that is available, 30 million solutions that is projected to be there in the nature that is waiting to be, waiting to be translated, I would say. Okay, so, so there are some excellent resources I'll, I'll tell you. One is asknature.com. This is run by Janine Benius herself. Then uh, 3.8 is another uh, biomimicry or biomimetic site. So you can visit these sites. There is some structure to this discipline. Understanding the structure is important, though it is simply said that you, you look at nature and you translate them. It is not as simple as that. You need to identify which structure that you're talking about, study them in detail, and which aspect that you want to translate, how to translate them, and so on. Okay, so these could be the primers for you in order to understand them. <coughs> for the next. So there are, this is what I told you, there, are, there is a defined structure uh, to this particular discipline. There is something called as biomimetic taxonomy, which helps you to zero in on a particular solution. So the inner circle tells you what kind of solution do you require? Are you looking at movement? Are you looking at deriving energy? Are you looking at stay put? Are you looking at yourself getting anchored somewhere or something like that? Very broadly, you define your technology. Go to the next. Okay, it gives you a series of solutions. Go to the next. It gives you a series of solutions. It gives you even references and so on. So try to understand this particular bio, bio, biomimetic taxonomy. I'm not dwelling deep into this, <coughs> but this can act as a scaffold for choosing appropriate solutions for your problems. Okay. Next. I'm shifting gear a little bit, Ra. In order to give you, uh, Nisi ma'am, how much time do I have, ma'am? Sir, take your time, sir. Okay. Okay. If things are getting bored, uh, please stop me, ma'am, so that I can quickly wind up and stop it. Okay, ma'am? Sir? Okay, ma'am. Got it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the question is, why biomimicry? Why do you want to do biomimicry? Why not the existing discipline that we already have? Because biomimicry seems to be giving you sustainable and functional solution. It kind of brings us into the right relationship with the nature, right relationship. We have a very skewed, unpleasant relationship with nature inadvertently or deliberately at times. We are having a very skewed marriage 
Okay, so it's very important to convert them into a very fruitful association. So you need this biomimetic solution helps you to manufacture thing without harsh conditions. Look at the way in which the nitrogenous enzyme, uh, uh, nitrogenous enzyme fixes nitrogen. Look at the Haber process that we already have in order to create nitrogenous fertilizers. The kind of temperature and the pressure that is required. It creates its own in ambient temperature and ambient condition. So whether you want to have a technology that manufactures without any hard condition is the question. Look for biomimetic solutions. Then the biomimetic solutions are important because the biological system always run on sunlight. Not always. There are certain uh, organisms that do not run in sunlight. You have uh, chemo, autotrophic organisms deep down the ocean, you know, in the ocean, uh, in the deep sea vents, people call it. Smokers, people call it. So they, those are not dependent on the sunlight, but majority of the organisms in the biosphere are dependent on sunlight. So they are dependent on sunlight. They create opportunities from the waste. Look at an ecosystem. One's waste becomes a feedstock for the other. So it's a closed loop system basically. But now ours is an open loop system. When you create a house, you bring marbles from Rajasthan. Then you bring laterite stones, for example, from Mangalore and so on. It's all open system. It's not a closed loop local economy. Which is the characteristic typical feature of an ecosystem, which is sustainable. So you get such solutions through biomimicry. That is exactly what, uh, the reason why we need to look at biomimicry. So as I mentioned, the fastest way to learn is to pick up a new mentor. Biomimicry provides you 3 million mentors like that. So for a biomimetics or a bioneer, people are now called, even biologists are called as bioneer. Biology and engineer, you know, we combine the words together. You get bioneer. So <clears throat> considers nature as the mentor. So you have 30 million expert strategists to advise you. Just you have to have a keen ear to listen to those advices and create something that is sustainable. That's something that do doesn't go against nature. That something doesn't manufacture in a spurious fashion and so on. Okay, that's exactly the reason, reason why biomimicry has to be biomimicry has to be adopted. Amrita, next. So the biomimicry is, in, these are the discussions which I want to bring it, bring, bring it onto the table in order to give you a kind of a, kind of a idea that the biomimicry is not biophilia, it's not a love of nature that is driving this particular discipline. Rather, it's a tangible scientific discipline tangible diet, uh, scientific concepts that is driving this, okay? So the biomimicry can be carried out at different levels. One is called as the natural form or the natural process or the natural ecosystem. I can give you an example. If it is a natural form, you can look at owls, for example. You just take the feather of an owl, it can teach you many things. For example, if you, if you zoom in on the structure of the, uh, of the feather of the owl, you know, it has small bristles. So those bristles, they come together, they lock each other. In fact, you are looking at a non-zipper fastener. So imagine people have created clothes that can be removed from anywhere. So there's no need for a particular location in order to position your button. It can close anywhere, seal anywhere, and can be removed from anywhere and so on. So you are looking at that particular aspects of a feather. So that is the natural form that you are looking at. Or you are looking at a natural process. For example, you are looking at the assembly of owl feather at an ambient temperature. You wanted to know how this beautiful chitin made structure is assembled at the benign ambient bodily conditions. So you're looking at slightly deeper conditions. Or you look at its natural ecosystem. So feather is not looked at its isolation. Feather is part of an owl. 
that is part of a forest ecosystem, that is part of a biosphere. So you don't look at owl in isolation, rather you consider all the aspects of an owl together. Okay, so these are the different forms. These are the different stages in which biomimicry can be performed. So when you're looking at natural forms, you need not worry about how these materials will be carried to different locations, whether it will be carried through pet, um, petrol vehicles and so on, because you know that the petrol can be polluting in nature. So you're not worried about that. But when you're looking at natural processes, you're still worried about those aspects. When you're looking at ecosystem processes, you're worried about from manufacture to distribution, to usage, to recycling, and so on. Okay, so you're looking at different levels of, of, of understanding the structural and the functional principles of the biological system and mimicking them. Next. Amrita, next. Now I'll take three examples Ra, very quickly <clears throat> to just drive home the point that nature can be a model, nature can be a measure, and nature can be a mentor. <coughs> Sorry. So it can be a model. Look at agriculture. <coughs> One minute. Nature can be a model. Look at agriculture. <clears throat> the agriculture field that you're seeing actually, it's not sustainable. Because so the sustainable agriculture is, in, is one in which sustainable agriculture is the one which does not deplete people and does not deplete land. Well said. That's what an agriculture is. It should be self-sustaining. It shouldn't drain the nutrients out from the soil. It should be replenishing in nature. It should be productive and so on. That's the ideal feature of an agriculture. But whatever that we are doing right now, it's not sustainable, no doubt. Though we consider green revolution to be the one that has mitigated poverty itself, but the way in which it has affected the land Many of the lands have become fallow because nutrients have been drained from it. It's no more productive as it used to be 10, 15 years before. Okay, so you want an alternative. So do you have a biomimetic solution as an alternative is the question. So you have one for the agriculture. I can give you that very quickly. Amrita, next. So where do you want to look at for a productive, sustainable agriculture? Prairies. The prairies are the grasslands. So they have few trees. They are predominantly populated by grasses. Okay. So they are characterized by decreased water runoff. Why? Because the, the roots, you know, the adventitious roots, they cling on to the soil particle. Okay. The water... Uh, cannot erode the soil away. So decreased water runoff. It is a carbon dioxide sink. Any ecosystem is a carbon dioxide sink, you know, carbon dioxide sink. Nutrient rich. So soil texture is suitable for water retention. It has a mixed population. For example, legumes with symbiotic root bacteria add nitrogen to the soil. Then you have the, uh, the flowering plants that attract pollinators and so on. So how different is the prairies from the agricultural field that we have, the beautiful, monotonous agricultural field that we saw in the previous picture? This one doesn't look very attractive. It is constituted by different flora and fauna. It is polycultural. It's not a monoculture, it is a polyculture. So you might think that the polyculture is less productive, it is not so. 
the system like a priory is more productive than the monoculture system that we are talking about. Because in biological system, diversity is the key. Because you have different ecological niches that needs to be occupied by different flora and fauna in order to carry out that specified function, in order to operate all of the ecosystem. Prairie does that beautifully. So whether we can learn anything from prairies is the question. We can. In fact, people have done already. Next. So people have already practiced, started practicing one, something called as polyculture or permaculture is what they call. It. Okay. It is called as perennial grain cropping continuously. It is operated perennial grain, grain cropping or permaculture it is called. So they use perennial polycultures with mutually beneficial relationship. They choose the flora and fauna accordingly relationship to increase the health and productivity of the crops, pest control, fertility, nutrient cycling, erosion control, drought resistant, water retention, and carbon, carbon sequestration are all managed by the judicious choice of flora and fauna. Okay. So these kind of farming are very sustainable, cost-effective, reduced soil in, uh, erosion, decreased dependence on petroleum-based or natural gas-based natural gas products, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, and so on. What else do you require? This is not organic farming that we are talking about. Even organic farming is nowadays becoming unsustainable due to the exorbitant cost involved in doing organic culture. Instead, you have a mechanism in order to do that farm like a prairie okay next so these are the different grains that are used so people make judicious choices perennial weeds instead of annual weeds perennial rice instead of annual rice is chosen okay Nitrogen fixing plants are chosen to be part of this consortium and so on. I'm not dwelling deep, deep into this. This is a different aspect altogether. We can always <clears throat> learn about these processes. Next. Next is how a nature can be a <clears throat> A mentor. So if you look at the way in which our cities, the way in which our cities are functioning, you know, if you look, if you compare and contrast with the natural ecosystem and the urban cities, urban dwellings, I should say, urban environment, a natural ecosystem has an energy budget between 1,000 and 10,000 kilocalories per meter square per year. That is the energy budgets. But look at the urban environment. 100,000 to 300,000 kilocalories per meter square per year, whooping. It's guzzles energy and material like anything. Doesn't function like a natural ecosystem. It's not sustainable anymore. So whether we can learn anything from nature in order to create sustainable, energy efficient, energy um, Material efficient cities or not is the question. You have answers for that. Next. Amrita, next. So look at the termite mounts for inspiration. <clears throat> So I'm not dwelling deep into this. These are the things that we all can read and understand. Termite mounds, you know, it has a special requirement to maintain its temperature, a constant temperature inside, in its interior, a constant temperature. Why? Because certain termite mounds, they maintain something called as a fungal garden, you know. When you're talking about incubator in your microbiology laboratory, incubator is already there. So deep down below the surface of the soil, there are 
tunnels and cavities that houses a special type of fungus. They feed them with ripe materials so that a special species alone is grown there that can serve as a kitchen, that can serve as a source of food for the uh, termites. So it's very important to maintain an, a particular temperature inside the termite mound. So how does it do it is the question. So you can study many things uh, from termites. For example, in Australia, people say that there are termite mounds that actually face the magnetic north. How does a small insect like a termite with a limited lifetime, it doesn't see the building of the whole termite mound in its lifetime, build something of that gigantic that faces north? Why north? People say that when it faces in that particular direction, the sunlight that falls on that is lesser. So it gets heated up less than any other. So how has it devised a judicious method like that, very ingenious method like that? Okay, so look at the structure of the termite mound. So when you look at the structure of the termite mound, what really happens is that a beautiful flow of air is affected inside the mound so that the hot air always raises and it is released through the chimney. So it has a chimney-like structure. On the top, it is open. So the metabolic heat and the heat that is generated by the shining of the sun on the mound is responsible for circulating that. You know that whenever you heat air, you know, the hot air becomes less denser and rises. So the, the hotter air, they rise and it escapes through the chimney and the colder air is taken inside. So this circulation is maintained. It is not as simple as I said, but there are engineering aspects and uh, thermodynamic aspect to it, okay, which is really interesting to understand. There are some excellent papers, but this is in a nutshell what it is. It allows proper circulation and ventilation of the air. So whether you can create something of a, like a termite mount, create a building like a termite mount is the question. In fact, I have created. Next. Next, Amrita. I'm not dwelling deep into it. It's very beautiful to see structures uh, of termite mounds. What do they do is they pour plaster of Paris into a termite mound, into a abandoned termite mound rather. Okay, then they make a cast out of it. When they pull out the cast, you know, you can see the intricate structures of the termite mound. It has caverns, it has tunnels, it has small chambers, brooding chambers, they are called, where the eggs are laid and, and so on, you know. And the chambers for uh, the culture of the fungi and so on. It's a, it's, a, it's a world by itself. Whatever that you see only is the tip of the iceberg on, this, on the top, on the surface. Next. <clears throat> so these are the two, uh, these, these, uh, this is one building that I've taken as an example. You have another building in London uh, that's also created uh, based on the inspiration of termite mounds. The East Gate Center building in Harare, Zimbabwe. Okay, so this building is created in a similar fashion. It is created based on the structure of the termite mount, okay, where effective circulation of the air happens. I'm not dwelling deep into the, uh, the nuances of it. It doesn't require any air conditioning. Throughout the year, it maintains a uniform temperature and so on. Okay, it saves lots of money. It's, the, the rents of these rooms are lesser because uh, the cost of the electricity and others are lesser. The rent, the, the cost for renting is also lesser. Okay, it's more energy efficient and so on. Okay, the next. Okay, you can, the next one, these are the details. Amrita, next. Now, in India, you have another beautiful example. Okay, I'll, I'll just introduce to you this particular example. It is called Lavaza. So Lavaza <clears throat> is a city in the outskirts of Maharashtra. Uh, 
uh, kind of uh, outskirt of uh, Mumbai. It's an 8,000 8, acre city. So it is affected by seasonal flooding uh, from monsoons. It's in the uh, it's it, it's bordering the Western Ghats <clears throat> mountain range on one side, causes the storm clouds to shed its water. So heavy rainfall. Uh, so nine meters of water for three months. Okay, it gets inundated with water, then remains arid during monsoon. It, it, there is a surge in water during the uh, <clears throat> summer. It remains arid. So that's the kind of, that is, that's the location of a city that was built on the biomimetic principle, Lava's Itis God. The beauty is Janine Benius was the consultant for this particular building. You can go to the next one. <clears throat> this building was took inspiration from three. One is barrel cacti. So usually, uh, whenever they plan a city based on biomimetics, you know, they look for inspiration from local flora and fauna. One minute. They take inspiration from local flora and fauna. <clears throat> the barrel cacti, you know, they've adopted it in order to uh, dot the roofings of the settlements. Okay, so that corrugated shape, etc. You know, they are effectively designed in order to trap water and store them. Barrel cacti. Then they have taken inspiration from the harvester ants. The harvester ants. They have a very beautiful structure. I can give you a personal story as well, a little later. You can see that particular structure. You can see there is a central chamber. Then there are concentric rings around it. These concentric rings. So this is, this is a raised mound, basically, with concentric rings around it. These concentric rings effectively prevents flooding. So these organisms have found ways in order to overcome the seasonal flooding that happens in this particular region. So the banyan is tree is adopted in order to derive the principle of effective shading. How does it how does it encompass a particular region? How does it bifurcate and how does it create a canopy that creates an effective shade and so on? So these are the three systems that were adopted and studied in detail in order to create this particular city. The barrel cacti, the harvester ants, and the banyan. Next. So the barrel cacti, you know, the vertical ridges ensures self-shading and water capture and so on. OK, those are the things that we've already mentioned. Next. Amata, next. So in fact, <clears throat> there are different buildings that are built on inspiration from nature sponges, for example, buildings in a building in London that resembles a sponge, dragonfly uh, stadium in Germany, termite mound uh, building in USA. Then you the, the famous bird's nest, the, the, the central stadium uh, during China, I mean, the Beijing Olymp Olympics, you know, the bird's nest, the tree bark uh, in, uh, in, uh, was a, served as an inspiration in order to build <coughs> a building in Melbourne and so on durian fruit in Singapore and so on. So in fact, Lavaza is not an isolated uh, kind of an example. You have multiple examples throughout the world. Next. So 
So the last one, the measure. Okay, whether we are building anything that is sustainable is the question. I told you nature can be a measure. You can place the natural solution and your solution against each other, compare and contrast, find out whether it is sustainable or not. So nature is a extreme measure against which you can find out whether your technology is sustainable or not. So the measure is what is required in an industry. Okay, I can give you one quick example and stop there. Next. Amrita, next. Okay, whether you can derive any <clears throat> whether you can derive any inspiration from the lush green tropical forest or not, teeming with life, productive, efficient in capturing, capturing light, produces th things in benign conditions and so on. So there are many lessons that you can learn from the tropical rainforest. Next. Okay. So in this case, <clears throat> you can see that the different components in, uh, present in a natural ecosystem, you know, they collaborate with each other with regard to energy, with regard to feedstock and so on. Then naturally, if you look at it, there is an efficient usage of energy, efficient usage of material, and the productivity is naturally higher. Okay, whether we can create an industrial complex Mimicking the ecosystem of a rainforest, for example, is the question. We can. So the next, next slide. Run. But the next. Okay. So this is one <clears throat> kind of a experimentation, very productive experimentation at that, which is called as the Kahlenberg symbiosis. So the Kahlenberg symbiosis, in fact, it is a small town, an industrial town in an ancient harbor town in Denmark. So they created an industrial symbiosis there. Industrial symbiosis in the sense that different interest industries in that particular complex behave. Hello, sorry, sir. Sir, I'm sir. Hello? Ah, just sir, mute I. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Now it's okay? Sorry. Yes, yes, it's fine. Okay. So, Kahlenberg uh, uh, symbiosis is kind of an effort in order to function like an ecosystem, make an industry, make industries function like an ecosystem. Okay, the next. Amrita, next slide. Okay, the participants, you know, exploit each other's residual or byproducts mutually, as I told you. Resources like steam, gas, cooling water, then gypsum, which are the byproduct of cement industry and so on, you know, are exchanged amongst the company. Excess heat, for example, is used for fish farming, heating nearby homes, heating greenhouses for agriculture and so on, you know. So other byproducts like, for example, sulfur, the fly ash, the sludge, are sold companies in the vicinity. So the manufacturing and the selling happens in 
the vicinity itself. It's provincial, it is local. So like in an ecosystem, all the principles of the ecosystem are imbibed in order to create an industrial symbiosis like this. So what is the outcome? Without much going into the nitty gritty, what is the outcome? Reduced consumption of resources and a significant reduction in environmental footprint. Okay, so just by understanding the functioning of the natural ecosystem, whether you can translate them, adopt them into functioning of otherwise spurious, otherwise detrimental, environmentally detrimental, uh, industrial functioning is the question. You can is the answer. Amartya, next slide. So this gives you a kind of a picture of industrial ecosystem. How does it look like? OK, so you have different components. All of the components are connected by every other, connected to every other components. It functions like an ecosystem. You don't have much of base, much wastage of energy and materials. Whatever that is uh, comes out as a wastage is sold locally. OK, again, the resources flows into the system itself. It has a closed loop system. OK, which is typical of the natural ecosystem. OK, next. So we have our own a few lessons that we have learned in our dockyard itself, in our small laboratory in Amrita School of Biotechnology. I'll give you a few examples so that it's fun practicing biomimicry. OK, so we have uh, the, the predominant ecosystem that we see in our locality in column areas, you know, but things are dwindling very fast, mangroves. So what we were really interested with, the mangroves, you know, Beautiful or um, beautiful systems they are, plants they are. Uh, <clears throat> the roots usually are positively geotropic. They follow the gravity. But there are roots, whenever it hits a zone where it is anaerobic, it becomes negatively geotropic. It comes up. Beautiful it is. So it spouts out and it acts as a system to capture air and feed it into the region which is anoxic in nature, which doesn't have oxygen in it. So we thought of a similar problem existing in composting. Usually during composting, you know, windrow composting, people call it. Okay, large land, they form rows of composting, compost, okay, then leave it for composting. After a period of time, intermittently, they have to be turned so that uh, aeration can happen, dissipation of the heat happens and so on. But what if, if I have a system that can actually pump in air passively without any energy into the composting was our question. So we ended up looking at the pneumatophores. These are the aerating roots, you know, pneumatophores. So pneumatophores basically, what do they have? You know, they have something called as lenticels. On the surface, there are micro microscopic pores through which the oxygen can diffuse. Then what really happens, you know, the beauty is there are parenchymatous cells. These cells, they have their own walls. These walls, they dissolve. When they dissolve, two cells get connected together. They form a tube. So the lenticels have a, a long tube connected to the inner tissue. So the oxygen through the lenticels can go through these tube and actually perfuse. But there is a problem here. You need to have something to actively pull the oxygen inside. Because once the oxygen tension comes to equilibrium inside and outside, you know, it doesn't flow anymore. So you have to create a kind of a difference in oxygen tension. That tension is nothing but the metabolism of the cells, underlying tissue. They start utilizing them. The oxygen becomes lower here. More oxygen comes inside. So what we thought that this is an act kind of a solution for our problem. So what we did was, next, next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> next, so see here, we created a pneumatophore-like structure with polystyrene in this case. 
or styrofoam, you call it. So they have small pores on the surface and the pores are connected. And what we have done is we have, in order to create a difference in the oxygen tension, we have added an obligate aerobic organism. You know what is obligate aerobic? It compulsorily, mandatorily requires air. So what really happens is the oxygen starts flowing, the air starts flowing through the lenticel-like pores, goes into the interior. The bacillus utilizes the oxygen, more air comes inside. So that's how we tested this particular system. It beautifully works, improving the composting many folds. And the composting also gets completed much faster than the compost that is unturned, left unturned, you know. Turning, of course, improves the composting. Okay, so these are the uh, kind of small works that we've done, which was fun. Next. Another is, we were really interested with another organism called cicada. The cicada, you know, the beauty of this particular insect is <clears throat> their wing is glistening clean. They have to maintain it clean. No dust and bacteria shouldn't attach to it because its aerodynamicity, its function reduces. Okay, it has to keep its wings clean. So anybody would have guessed that it would secrete some chemicals <clears throat> in order to keep its skin clean, but it's not. It, it modifies the structure. It modifies the topography so that it becomes antibacterial. Antibacterial by structure. So what does it do is the question. When we under, try to understand, we, we developed a kind of a respect for this particular organism. When you take a micrographic, electron micrographic picture of the wings of cicada, cicada is the one that makes a, a spooky noise in the middle of the, um, uh, in, 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 in the middle of the forest, you know, the cicada, different types of 2,000, 3,000 varieties of cicada are there. Okay, so when you take a microscopic image, you can see small pillars, the small pillars around 120 nanometer height, 60 nanometer width, with around 200 nanometer distance and so on. Small pillars, you can see a forest of pillars. This forest of pillars never allow the bacteria comfortably rest on the surface. It just pierces the bacteria to death. You know that the bacteria has that fluid membrane on its surface, you know. It just cannot stay. It just pierces the... So you can say, I told you the 200 nanometer distance of each pillar. If you are taking an E. coli, two, uh, two micron is the size. Around 10 pillar occupies the organism. So the organism cannot sit on it. So what we thought was, if I can actually mimic the structure, onto catheters, for example. The catheters that goes into the uh, urinary tract, you know, where people have difficulty in removing the uh, urine and so on, okay? So the, the problem that they face is formation of biofilm on the surface, on the interior and so on. So whether I can dot the surface with this kind of structure, which can effectively pre prevent infection or prevent biofilm formation or not is the question. So we went into that second stage and we are still working on it. What we did was we translated the structure of the cicada onto a material, different material, which is called as PDMS. And we got the structure and we tested the um, antibacterial effects on it. It works. The next step would be to take it and imprint it on Teflon, for example, that goes into the uh, construction of these catheters so that we would have effectively created a structure that resembles the cicada wings that effectively prevents the organism from binding to it, thereby effectively preventing the biofilm formation, effectively improving the longevity of the catheter and so on. Okay, the next. Okay, so these are the, uh, so the, the beauty is what we have done is, um, in that way it was fun. We, we took the structure of the cicada itself. We took the cicada wings. The cicada wings has uh, protrusions on its surface, you know. Then we took another surface and pressed on it. So what you get is holes here. Like a mold, you know, you get holes here. So that is what you see in the bottom left. 
you can see holes. Those holes are created on the PDMS. Then on the holes, we pour another material so that you get the original structure of the. It's like the plaster Paris mold that you do, you know. So going through these processes was really fun. Every time you take a micrographic picture in order to find out the structure is formed or not and so on. But thanks to Cicada for teaching us something that is very, very important. You don't require any um, antibacterial um, chemicals in order to kill it. Rather, the structure itself kills the organs. Okay, next. Next. This is how the, this is the original picture that you have taken. You can see the organism just lies flat on its surface and it's killed, gone. So a material that kills the bacteria. So you're, you're, you're not talking about antimicrobial resistance. You don't run into the problem of antimicrobial resistance and so on. You, know? you have a structure that kills the organism, as simple as that. Next. Next. So you have, uh, for example, you know, uh, I'm not dwelling deep into it, right? because uh, we have already uh, are running out of time. You can go. So different solutions are there in order to create <clears throat> better afforestation, you know. So people have created uh, bromeliad-like uh, structures. Bromeliads, you know, those are uh, beautiful plants that you have in your garden, which holds water, you know, in its leaves. You can see water getting, uh, got, getting collected inside. So if you can create a structure, that looks like a bromeliad, and you have a seed inside. Okay, so the problem with uh, uh, the problem with afforestation is sorry, is though you 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 would have broadcast the seeds across a particular land, how many of them they germinate is the question. Okay, so people say that a larger percentage of them uh, do not germinate. So in that case, you know you have a structure that protects the seeds, and the germination percentage increases. You know you are actually improving the afforestation. So people have created something like, uh, that resembles like a bromeliad, it's called nucleario and so on. There are umpteen number of examples. Next. Okay, next. Next, Amrita. So uh, my, my aspiration is, uh, anybody, you know, we are all biophiliacs. I don't uh, know any person who doesn't love nature, you know. In uh, With some degree, we all love nature. Though somebody explains them beautifully, be it a poet, some, somebody uh, paints a picture beautifully, be it a painter, um, inspired to create a good music and so on. Somebody really simply loves it. Probably can't explain it, but we are all biophiliacs. But this is exactly what we wanted to see. When we look up the sky, you know, the sky is not plain. It is not. Uh, it, it, it is not without any color, without any uh, canopy that you see. But I wanted a sky looking like this, with lot of trees towered and and the the, the small flickers of sun rays, glimmers of sun rays. I would call coming into. Thereby you appreciate the sun rays and so on. So this is exactly what I wanted to see. Next. Probably this is exactly what I wanted my kids, for example, little selfish in this particular regard. Whenever they walk, you have lots of trees around, lot of plants around, and uh, <clears throat> lots of flora and fauna around. Okay, this is what exactly what we want. So probably uh, nowadays, you know, there are some encouraging images that are coming. In certain regions, afforestation is improving. Okay, so de deforestation is slowly, uh, in certain regions at least, a uh, kind of a break is being applied to, de uh, to rampant deforestation. Okay, so one minute, right? rampant deforestation and people very recently I uh, read an article you should all do it they have actually calculated how many trees is required in order to reverse the climate change so those are the kind of uh, preparedness that we are 
in. Those are those are the kind of intent the younger generation is having. Those are the kind of sensitivities that the younger generation is having that we didn't have probably, or in my generation didn't have. So this is exactly what the picture has to be there in the future. So thank you so much, Ra. Next slide. So uh, let me stop it with one more quote of uh, Janine Benius. So why should we look at nature and uh, what nature can provide, you know? Her words are beautiful. So I thought that I'll put it as a last slide before the thank you slide, you know? So the living hope world holds answers for us to create a more resilient, regenerative and beautiful world. It is time to quiet our cleverness, beauty. It is time to quiet our cleverness, to observe and listen deeply and reconnect to nature's wisdom by just asking, how does nature solve this? So what you want to, what you want to have is that humbleness. What you have to have is that the intent to ask that simple question, how nature solves it. So thank you so much, Ra. Thank you for listening for so long, you know. I shouldn't have to spend too much of time. Okay. Next slide, Amrita. Okay, thank you so much. Nisi, ma'am, done. <laughs> so much, sir. Very excellent. Very interesting. Any queries to sir or any clarifications can be made by proceeding directly or can be posted in the chat box. I repeat, any queries to sir or any clarifications can be made by uh, proceeding directly or can be posted in the chat box. <laughs> Nipin, you can ask the question directly. Uh, so, good evening. Uh, sorry, there might be a small interference from the. I'm in a bus now, so there might be small sound interference. Yeah, uh, sir, it's actually not a question. I I just work uh, here now in Expo Dubai, Expo Europe. Uh, I just want to add two or three structures which is available here inside Expo, Super, which is also yeah. inspired completely from the nature. Uh, yeah, yeah. First one is there is a pavilion called Astera Pavilion. The, uh -huh. It is completely self-sustainable for electricity. Okay. Uh -huh. How it is self-sustainable? Because the solar panels uh -huh. are all in the form of a flower. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. which will have a maximum exposure of sunlight on that one throughout the day. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. All those things. Yeah, so that is one of the second one. Um, it is actually like the buildings over here. They have a special cap capability because uh, UAE, when the time when they started this um, expo, was having high humidity. Okay. So they have made the buildings in such a way that it can absorb the water from uh, the atmosphere. Beauty. And the yeah. same water is actually used in the washrooms here. Wow. So, uh, so that is uh, what I think that I should share it uh, with. Uh, ah, this thank you, thank you, Nipin. In Nipin. fact, uh, if possible, oh. you, you should send pic uh, pictures of that to me, uh, Sure, sir. Sure, I will. I will send you that one. Just give me two, three days. I'll, I'll, tomorrow, I'll send you that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because so I just uh, came uh, out the, of that. Especially the, especially the arrangement of solar panels. People are uh, also sure, looking sure. at the arrangement of canopy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, when you look at a tree uh -huh, from the uh -huh. top, the, the canopy uh -huh. is arranged in such a way that. Uh, mm -hmm. The canopy is arranged in such a way that maximum sunlight falls on uh, the every uh, leaves of uh, a particular tree. Exactly. So exactly. One, exactly. one leaf is not under the shade of the other. That's the idea. So the canopy itself is arranged in such a fashion. Moreover, people are also looking at there are flowers that follows the sun, you know, the sunflower, for example. Exactly. Yes. It's, yeah. it's somewhat so, like that only. I don't know yeah. that the flowers will move. It's uh, the, the solar panels will move according to the sunlight. Uh, but it is the, uh, the, uh, the panels. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very beautiful to see you also. Nice to hear, Nipin. You have to send me that. Thank you, thank you. Sure, Thank sure. you so much. Uh, thank you. Sir. Any more queries?
आदित्य सर मैम आई हैव अ क्वेरी सर टेल मी मैम एक्चुअली इफ द स्टॉक इज एक्सेल एंड इट इज माइंड ब्लोइंग Uh, I have a question like uh, uh, as a representative uh, uh, from teacher community or uh, some parent community. See, yeah. uh, what is the quality like? Uh, you have elaborated and in detail. Now, what are the peculiarities of this uh, uh, substances in nature and how we can uh, or how nature is inspiring us, etc. So, to develop these things, in fact, uh, what are the qualities essential for a student? Because I understand the maximum uh, people who are attending this uh, webinar is students. So, yeah. as a resource person, as an experienced person, can you just suggest what is the essential quality to develop to identify uh, uh, these nature secrets to develop? Because they are all future scientists. So, uh, what is your advice to this uh, student community? That's an that's an excellent question, ma'am. In fact, <clears throat> I wouldn't prescribe anything. but uh, personally uh, i feel that we all have inherently that ability to uh, ability to uh, kind of appreciate nature itself but what is required is little bit of time and keen observation is what is required for example uh, i i i forgot to uh, tell you that personal story that i uh, had usually i used to narrate that um, <clears throat> for example ma'am the non descript uh, the ants that they make and uh, the the ant mounds you know ma'am uh, whenever you see <clears throat> especially uh, especially they are quite active before the monsoon so you can see small holes being made and the ants they meticulously pick up one uh, uh, one one grain of sand at a time and they make a elaborate tunnel and elaborate cavern uh, just below the surface of the soil so how does that inspire us i'll give you a kind of a <clears throat> the way in which it has inf- inspired me for example and uh, it would have inspired anybody else as well not very special with me so when you see when you keenly watch them what they are actually doing you can see that each of the ant picks up a soil particle and puts it on the rim of the 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 hole that is excavated then always there is a danger of the soil mount crashing into the excavated uh, hole so you can also you can also if you keenly watch you can also see there are a collection of ants that actually pushes the mound to the outside so that it doesn't fall inside so it's not just simple excavation some kind of a management is also happening around then you can also curiously see as though their time is over meaning they are the working time is over you can see some ants very quickly moving away from the mount you cannot actually trace i i, I very keenly uh, wanted to find out where did they go they don't have any special location they go they just go away that's it as if their work is over their tenure is over so in fact if you have more curiosity i went on to have the 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 white marker put a marker on the on the surface of a ant and find out how many times is going inside and outside it's very interesting so what is required is a keen eye and some patience and lot of time you know then i went on reading these organisms are so vulnerable it's doing this just before the monsoon and what happens if the monsoon comes before their work is completed and what happens if the whole of their precious work is spoiled by inundation with water then amazing it is to understand the information they build their mount to be destroyed can you can you imagine they build their mount so that they await for the rain to fall the soil they get covered the top is sealed water is present a deep elaborate excavation below the soil so you have a construction to be destroyed so that is their ingenuity so these small efforts of just loving a life just looking at a leaf how beautiful it is and just going on building on it is the key it takes you to different realms whereby you can get interested with the plants get interested with the animals and so on the other day when we saw a palm 
the leaf of the palm looks like the banana leaves, but the palm looks like a typical palm, the stem and so on. It's called as banana palm. We wanted to know, it is the only uh, plant that produces a cobalt blue seed, beautiful blue seed. Now we are waiting for that seed to come. It only, it, 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 it produces the seed and dies. So we need to wait for years in order to see that seed. So we are patiently waiting. So we develop some kind of respect for that uh, particular thing. We, we tend to look at things differently. So that is what is required. A journey needs to be started. Probably biomimicry is that particular journey. I hope the queries are cleared. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Sir, can we wind up the session now? Yeah, sure, Amrita. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Abhirami, you can take over. Excuse me, uh, just, just one small little uh, thing. My name is Ajay. Um, I was um, Mr. Ajit sir's um, student when I was in uh, SNGC. Student uh, friend, I would say. <laughs> exactly, yes, sir. <laughs> so actually, uh, I'm working right now. I'm in Muscat, uh, but I took a half day off. Uh, thanks to Juby uh, for sending me the link. Uh, since I saw that uh, he was giving uh, a presentation, I took a half day off and I came and uh, uh, it was not a, uh, a waste of time. So thank you, thank sir. You. And thank, thank you, you uh, for sending the link and uh, good to see you, uh, Nisim ma'am. So, yeah, thank you all. Yes. So nice. Thank you, Ajay. Nice. Superb. Sir, uh, so, uh, Sujit, Sujit here. Sujit, if it is not too much, uh, uh, where is uh, Sindhu Chi Chi? Uh, Sindhu, uh, Sindhu uh, let me tell you one thing. I uh, forgot to tell you. I'm in I'm in quarantine right now, da. Yesterday okay. I got positive for positive. COVID. <laughs> I am I'm, I'm also I'm also positive. <laughs> uh, be positive. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I was in the middle of the uh, talk, you know. <clears throat> yeah, your throat. I could feel yeah. that. I could feel that. Yeah. Sorry, da, Sujit. I'll call you later with Sindhu. Sindhu Chechi. Yeah, sure, sure. Sir, so can we wind up? Yeah, Amrita, please. Oh, okay, sir. Abhirami? Thank you. Thank you, sir, for such a knowledgeable and mind-opening session. And now, for the Thanksgiving session, I invite M. Hari Krishnan, second MSc Microbiology and Chairman of Student Council for the formal vote of tanks. Thank you. Hari, you are the you are the first chairman, or I, I think I know of a chairman who, who was the first chairman of microbiology. How many chairmen after that? <laughs> uh, don't know, sir. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> continue, da, continue, Hari. Okay. All sir. the best. Honorable dignitaries, most valued guests, and my dear friends, it's my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of this department and Sri Narayana Guru College. I want to express my gratitude to Dr. Ajit Madhavan, Associate Professor, Amrita School of Biotechnology, for gracing this occasion with his presence and giving the light on the topic. Thank you, sir. I extend my sincere thanks to our beloved principal, Dr. Milankovan, for being backbone in our endeavors and constantly motivating us. I thank Dr. Nisi Prasad for, for her continuous support and organizing this event for us. Thank you, ma'am. Next, I acknowledge the immense contribution of, of our dedicated faculties. I thank Dr. Jubi, Dr. Keita, and Dr. Lakshmi Priya for their unflinching support and coordination. Thank you, ma'am. Also, I thank Ms. Amrita and Abhirami MSc students for this for their contribution. Last but not least, I thank all the participants who have joined for this national webinar. Once again, thank you all for making this event success. Thank you.
Department of Microbiology wholeheartedly thank each and every every participant of this session. And I bring upon to the notice that the link is being posted in the chat box. Participants, please do fill the same. I repeat, department. Uh, I bring upon to the notice that the feedback link is being posted in the chat box. Participants, please do fill the same. Certificates will be issued to the registered mail ID within seven working days. Heartfully thanking you all. Thank you, sir. Participants are recording. Participants. <laughs> <laughs>